Yesterday I talked about uh, optimal climate policy uh, and I started the discussion on the discount rate. This is obviously important. Uh, the higher the discount rate, the less we care about climate, uh, the less we care about the future and the less we care about climate change and the less we need to do about it, right? So our choice uh, of the discount rate is terribly important. So I made that point and divide the Ramsey rule. This is a canonical way of thinking about uh, the discount And essentially the Ramsey rule has that we should discount future money uh, for two reasons. One, uh, we are impatient. Uh, and second, we expect to be richer and therefore happier. So what I'm going to do uh, this morning is continue uh, the discussion of time discounting and talk about uh, uncertainty uh, as well. And then this afternoon I'll talk about equity uh, and how to measure all these things. When you're deciding on what the discount rate should be, you sort of bust in from all sides. First, you want discounting to, or any preference parameter, to somehow respect the will of the people, or perhaps follow, uh, if you're so inclined, uh, perhaps follow the guidance of some uh, philosophers or some religious leaders or, or whomever. So that puts a constraint on your choice. You also definitely you don't want to ignore the very far future. You just discount uh, at standard rates and anything that happens after 100 years or even after 50 years from now doesn't matter a whole lot. It is not really what you want to do, right? I mean, <laughs> the idea that because of time discounting you can just let the planet go warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer, this doesn't strike us as the right decision. Similarly, if we are deciding about nuclear waste, uh, nuclear power, power more generally, then the fact that some nuclear waste stays around for 10,000, 50,000 years does matter to us, right? Uh, so we don't just want to ignore uh, the distant future just because. And then there's a third constraint uh, on our choice of the discount rate, and that is that we want to be consistent across public policy. So if you're making decisions about investing in education, that's an investment in the future, and the amount of certain return on that investment, uh, whether it's private investment or public investment, then that implies this contract. When we're making decisions about how much to invest in pensions and the provision for, all care, uh, for care in our old age, that's an investment in the future. That's the decision about the future. Similarly, if we're making decisions about health, to make a decision about road safety. And whenever we're making uh, a decision uh, about climate change or about climate policy, which is an investment in the future, essentially buying a better climate or at least we're buying a climate that is not as bad as it otherwise would have been, not for today, but for 50, 100 years from now. One of the implications of climate change is that it affects human health. And say by investing in greenhouse gas emission reduction, we save uh, somebody from dying, an anonymous person from dying uh, in 2035. Uh, we have an opinion on that, right? Now, suppose that we invest in road safety and we're deciding whether or not to uh, put a roundabout, say, at the corner uh, of the Amsterdam to that and about Velvet Salam. And because of that, we save a life. In the year 2035, I mean, it takes time to uh, build roundabouts, right? There's no reason to say that the life saved because of the roundabout that we built and the lives that we saved because of greenhouse gas emission reduction would be any different, right? The life saved and life saved is the life saved. So if you're making decisions about road safety, then those decisions should be consistent with the decisions to make about climate policy. Right? You cannot say, well, that seems the road safety are worth less. Or worth more than that uh, because of climate change, right? Or avoided that uh, because of road safety and avoided that because of climate change. And if we look at the decisions that we make about healthcare, about road safety, about pensions, about education, then we typically find that people use a discount rate of five, six, seven, eight percent if they're talking about private households, 
uh, and governments often use four or five percent. Which governments often do, and we somehow need to be consistent with it. Now, if we are investing in road safety, we have a relatively short time horizon. We care about the next few decades. Uh, if we are investing in education, we care about the next few decades. If we're talking about climate change, of course, we are talking about longer time horizons. We're talking about the next few centuries. So the question that I'm going to ask and answer is, are there alternative ways of discounting that sort of would allow you to be consistent with investment in the relatively short term that you typically see a, a relatively high discount rate, uh, but at the same time don't ignore the very long term and therefore would permit or uh, would be consistent with higher investments in uh, climate change and standard discount rate. The answer to that question is a maybe. Uh, there's <coughs> three contenders for squaring this circle, right? And uh, the first uh, is hyperbolic discounting. A standard way of discounting in the future is to use a geometric discount rate, and that is what you see uh, displayed here. And the geo geometric discount rate is so called because it's essentially uh, the exponential of the discount rates rho times the time that has elapsed, the period that has elapsed, uh, delta. And it's just the case that uh, mathematicians call things with exponential processes geometric, right? Or rather, it's the other way around. Geometric processes have uh, exponential in it. There is an interesting implication of geometric uh, discounting or exponential discounting. And that is, if we look at the relative discount rate, the relative distance between two years, so uh, <laughs> we calculate the discount rate for the discount factor, sorry, for anything that happens in t years from now versus anything that happens in t plus delta years from now, if we take the ratio of the two, then the t drops out. And what we are left with is just the distance between t and t plus delta, that is delta, that is the only thing that enters uh, into uh, this relative discounting between two future points in time. This implies time consistency. The sheer fact that time has passed does not affect our decision. So if we make a decision today about something that we're going to do next year and that we can uh, pay off uh, in two years from now, the sheer fact that we make the decision now rather than tomorrow or next year that should not affect our decision. Of course, if prices have changed, if new information has arrived, then you should revise your decision. But just the fact that you're making the decision today versus tomorrow should not affect your decision. Uh, that's called time uh, consistency, and that is guaranteed by this property. But this property has a very strange implication. And that is that the relative distance between two years does not depend on how far out it is. Or in other words, if we have to choose between year 10 and year 11 to get our payoff, or the difference between year 10 years into the future and 11 years into the future, is the same as 100 and 101 years into the future, or 1,000 and 1,001 years into the future. That follows immediately from the exponential. And if you think about it, that is very peculiar. Surely 10 years into the future versus 11 years into the future is the same, the same as 10 years into the future and 110 years into the future? Or 1,000 years into the future and 1,100 years into the future? It's much more intuitive to say that, right? At least it's intuitive to me. <coughs> and there's a lot of experimental evidence, we'll come back to that this afternoon, a lot of observational evidence, and that suggests that people indeed use this sort of reasoning, that what matters is the relative distance in years rather than the exponent of the relative distance. Or in other words, that as people look further and further into the future, their relative discount rate or their uh, discount rate falls. And if you want to make sure that the distance between 10 and 11 
is the same as the distance between 10, or 100 and 110, or 1,000 and 1,100, then what we should do is uh, stick uh, a log in, and then we uh, indeed find that those relative distances uh, are the same. Yes, and an ad hoc way of doing it. I mean, it's been observed that people do use a lower discount rate as time progresses, as uh, they look further out into the future. But there's no sort of sound theory why it should be exactly this same. But what you do have is that the discount rate falls uh, as you move on. A better founded way of uh, having falling discounts rate over time follows from two lines of reasoning. One is uncertainty, and the other is disagreement. And the disagreement one is perhaps less well-founded, but it's easier to understand, it's easier to explain uh, than the uncertainty one. So suppose we have two people, and one argues that a discount rate should be 1%, and the other argues that a discount rate should be four, uh, 7% then you might say, well, let's just split the difference and use a discount rate of 4%. Right? That would be the fair thing to do. Uh, someone says 1, someone else says 7, so let's go with 4. That would be the wrong thing to do. What we're looking at here in this table is uh, what is the value of a 1,000 euros a year from now, 93, maybe 93. And then two years down, the thousand euros is only worth one hundred and eight. Two years into the future, it's only worth four. And hundred years into the future, it's only worth a euro. And then two hundred years into the future, it's worth uh, basically nothing. Right? That's the power of discounting. Uh, and if you use a seven percent discount rate, then anything that happens after a hundred years is basically irrelevant. So this is what the person who votes for a seven percent discount rate. How they would tell you a thousand euros. The person who argues for a one percent discount rate would tell you the future a lot more. And uh, would be different between getting a thousand euros now or nine hundred and ninety years from now, or three hundred and seventy, a hundred years from now. And that thousand euros today is still worth eighteen euros four hundred years from now, nineteen euros. Now, what happens if we split the difference? There's actually two ways of splitting the difference. One, as I just suggested, somebody votes for one and the other votes for seven, let's go for four. Uh, and here we're looking at the four percent uh, discount rate. Uh, so a thousand euros is worth uh, 960, and a year from now is worth uh, 20, and a hundred years from now is worth one cent, uh, 300 years from now. There is one way of splitting the difference. The other way of splitting the difference is not take the average over the discount rate, but take the average over the discount factors. This is the discount rate, these are the discount factors. If you take the average of these two, then something else happens, right? Then what we find is that these are the relative numbers. Uh, so we wouldn't care about a thousand uh, euros from now, it's worth uh, 962 uh, in years from now. Is worth 185 in 100 years from now, is worth 9 in 400 years from now. So then we then invert the discount factor that we have here to find what is the implied discount rate. We find it that, that it's close to 4% after one year, nothing else happens, right? And it's sort of like starts deviating from 4 and it gets. Closer and closer and closer and closer to the one that further we move out into the future. So, what has happened here? Well, essentially, the person who argues for a high discount rate essentially doesn't care anymore after a hundred years. So, at that point, that person is completely indifferent whether we get the money in 200 years or 300 years. Not completely indifferent. Almost completely indifferent. He just, he or she, doesn't care. Whereas the person who argues for a low discount rate 
continues to care whether the benefit will come in 200 years or 250 years or 300 years. Now, what the size of the payoff is. So, a fairer way of taking the average is to say that one person doesn't care, the other person does care. So, let's go with the person that has a preference there. Or a difference between two things, why would your vote come? So it is actually from a welfare perspective, and as well as from a fairness perspective, better to take the average of the discount factor rather than the discount rate, because the person who goes for a high discount rate doesn't care. The further we look out into the future, the effective discount rate converges from the average between the two. That's the starting point, but it converges to the lowest of the two, the minimum. And we see effectively a declining discount rate over time. The further we look out into the future, the lower the discount rate uh, becomes. Now, the exact same reasoning holds if instead of having a disagreement about what the discount rate should be, we are uncertain about what the discount rate should be. But I find the intuition harder, but numerically the exact same thing happens. Marty Weissman um, has done some numbers on this. Uh, if you assume that the uncertainty about the discount rate uh, is gamma, then we can actually come up with a closed form solution of what uh, our discount rate should be. And uh, what Weissman shows is <laughs> under uh, these regularity assumptions. The discount rate is alpha over 1 plus beta t. And of course, the greater t, the further we look out into the future, the lower the discount rate becomes. And that is exactly what you see happening here. For one year <laughs> into the future, it's 4%. For 400 years into the future, it's 1%. Right? And Weizmann's uh, equation just la allows us to parameterize this in a simple uh, way. I mean, you immediately have a calibration point, right? Where if you're looking at a one year time horizon, and you have one over one plus beta, and then you say, well, it should be roughly equal to 5%, right? Because that is the discount rate that we observe over short term uh, horizons. Does this matter? Oh, yes, it does. So what we're looking at here are various estimates uh, of the social cost of carbon. We talked about uh, those before. If you're looking at them for geometric discounting, for some reason, uh, the data decided to give the reason 1995 and 2005 prices. It's, it's a bit overkill, right? Because this is the uh, 101 correspondence between the two. Uh, but let's just hold the 2005 prices. Uh, so for a constant discount rate, or a constant pure rate of time preference, and if you use a high discount rate, you find uh, the self cost of carbon minus 3, if you go to the lower one, you find it's 13, uh, if you go to uh, no discounting at all, and this is the pure rate of time preference, I think it's 71. And this is uh, what we do if we use various ways of hyperbolic discounting or declining uh, discounting. This is the one I just talked about. The difference is rather stark. So if you calibrate the uh, Weizmann function that I just showed to have a 4% discount rate, uh, now the money discount rate in the short run, you find the social cost of carbon of 3. But if that is our starting point and we just let it fall over time, then we find the social cost of carbon at 107. And what matters there, of course, is not the 3 and 107. But the fact that it's more than 13, five times as large. But these things matter. These things matter for both. Then we go to different calibrations of how the discount rate should change over time. You can follow the alternative. To Weizmann, you can follow an uh, alternative that was suggested by uh, David Clear, who was adopted by the UK uh, government. You can follow the advice of Christian Bollier of Toulouse. And you can follow uh, the advice of uh, by the F. Newell and Pfizer. But what we find is A is very sensitive to the discount rate, but B, 
Yeah, if we go for declining the account rate, then we find that the social cost of carbon goes up quite considerably, right? But these things matter. The good thing about these uh, schemes is that they allow us to discount the near future at a conventional rate, but the far future at a much lower rate, right? So we are consistent. That was the second alternative. The third alternative, uh, which is theoretically the strongest, but perhaps the hardest to explain. The intertemporal welfare functions are just welfare functions. Right? And the proper way to derive a welfare function is not to stick in a function and see what happens, uh, but to start with axioms, say, you know, this is what the properties that we want the welfare function to have, and then given a certain set of such properties or axioms, what functions are consistent uh, with. Now, in the 60s, improvements derived uh, an impossibility theorem. And the impossibility theorem uh, is that over an infinite time horizon, there is no net present welfare function that simultaneously satisfy strong Pareto and anonymity. Now, strong Pareto is just the temporal version of Pareto, right? So, uh, what we say is that if you have a welfare a situation where somebody is better off and nobody is worse off, then we should prefer that situation. That is Pareto, if we're talking about an allocation of resources over people, Nine in our room here, if you make you better off, nobody else gets hurt, uh, then collectively we should prefer that, right? That's Pareto. And a strong Pareto is the same thing, but now we don't have nine people in a room, but we have nine generations over time. One generation gets better off, the others don't get worse off. We should like that, right? That's strong Pareto. Anonymity is equally intuitive. If we're talking about a group of people in a room, so we have nine people in the room, uh, everybody has a welfare of one, then we do a lottery and somebody gets uh, a welfare of two. Now, collectively, we should be, if we don't know anything about these people, we should be indifferent between whether you get the two or you get the two, right? That should not matter to our decision. That's anonymity, right? There is a welfare gain. It doesn't hurt anybody uh, at all. If the welfare gain falls randomly on somebody, we should not bother. We should not care about who it falls to. That's the axiom of anonymity. Then we're talking about a group of people that seems logical and fair to impose uh, that criteria. Now, what Kupnitz showed is that you cannot satisfy both strong Pareto and anonymity for a discounted, uh, for a, a net present welfare function. And that the, sort of your standard discounted welfare function violates anonymity is trivial, right? So let's look at a sequence of well-beings, third generation, second generation, third generation, fourth, fifth, fifth generation, Versus a sequence of well being, third generation, second generation, third generation. And these, these were a group of people, and this was person one, person two, person three, person one, person two, person three, you would not care, you would, you would not, you should be indifferent between the two. But if we apply discounting, I mean, good mutations, you can even clearly prefer this the second situation over the first situation. So, Discounting violates anonymity. Now, Kupnitz argued, uh, although it's not his most famous quote, <laughs> his most famous quote in this regard is actually that he absolutely abhorred the implications of the decision he was making, right? Uh, but he really argued that if we are talking about time, then strong Pareto is the more important axiom over anonymity. The strong Pareto is one generation gets better off, nobody else gets hurt, then we should prefer that. Whereas anonymity over time is actually very peculiar because people are not anonymous over time. 
one generation logically follows from the, the previous one. And there is a sequence there, and there is, if you have a group of people, you can resequence them. If you have a series of generations, you cannot resequence them. You cannot somehow pretend that you and your grandmother can swap places. That, that just doesn't work, right? So, yeah, Kupnon argued that if you have to choose in an intertemporal context between the two, and you have to, then sacrifice anonymity. Other people disagree with Kupnon's. I think they do that at their peril. Right? Is there a way out of here? And the answer is yes, there is a way out. In Kociela Cicilniski, at a second look at Kupnon's derivations in the mid 90s, and she said, Let's replace the axiom of anonymity with axioms of non-dictatorship and independence. To do that, then she found that welfare is the net weight, of, is the weight of some of net present welfare and welfare of the final generation. I had a problem with this, it's too fault in independence is a bit of a strange axiom. And, but more importantly, if you're talking about an infinite time horizon, what is the last generation, right? You're talking about very peculiar uh, and hard to quantify thing. So Alvarez Quadrado and, and Go Van Long had a look at her work and said, yes, we don't lead this independent axiom. Independent axiom is essentially that and the relative weight of two generations, if you pick those generations randomly, should always be the same. Uh, if you drop that uh, assumption and just go with non-dictatorship instead of uh, anonymity, then we find this uh, welfare assumption here. Now, what is non-dictatorship? That is a crucial uh, action here. So, anonymity essentially means that we are indifferent whether a windfall falls on one generation or another, and you said we cannot satisfy that. Non-dictatorship means that no single generation is the boss. That the welfare ordering of the net present welfare function is not determined by the welfare ordering of any single generation. If you take the standard net present welfare function with exponential discounting, then we actually find that the current generation is the boss. That all decisions that we make over time exactly correspond with the decisions that the first generation would make. But if we impose a condition that there can't be a dictatorship, then we have to, naturally, move away from the standard net present welfare uh, utility. Novaris Cordado and Van Long then run into a number. That is, they impose non-dictatorship of the present, but to balance that they have to impose non-dictatorship of somebody else as well or they have to uh, balance our preferences with the preferences of a future generation. And there they follow rules and say, let's counterbalance the interests of the present generation with the interests of the worst of generation. This is essentially an arbitrary choice. They have to counterbalance with somebody, and they say, let's pick the worst generation. And then what you get is a social welfare function and present social welfare function that is a greater sum of your standard net present welfare uh, criterion and the preferences of the generation that is worst off. And then the weights at one minus theta and theta. And then obviously the standard net present welfare function is nested in you, right? You just set theta to zero. The implications of this are different than what a lot of people would expect. Because, I mean, I sort of started off by saying, yeah, we should care about the future, and we should care about what's happening in the very long run, and so on and so forth. But if we work under the assumption that economic growth continues, or at least not reverses, then we are the poorest generation. This is the time zero. And that is, if we follow this line of reasoning, then we're going to discount the future more, not less, but more, right? Because we know also discount the future with this amount one minus uh, theta, right? And that is uh, borne out 
in this slide, uh, looking at the standard uh, Bentham type of uh, social net present social welfare function versus the Bentham Rolls one, was proposed by uh, Alvarez Squadrado and von Long. And because we assume in everything that is going on in the economic and planet that we are the poorest uh, generation, we discount the future more. And as a result, the social cost of power is lower uh, than it otherwise would be. And that is what uh, displayed here. That independent of the transversation, the only thing, only way to uh, overturn this is to go to a scenario where, where economic growth uh, indeed uh, reverses and slows down. 